So yeah, my name is Namion. I'm working on the perp tools at Google. And this time I'm talk about the data type profiling. So the, the goal is to get a precise memory access profiles with time information. So with this, you can see which data type in your program is accessed frequently and which field in the data structure is accessed. So it will help your program, help you uh, optimize your program by changing the layout of the data structure in a way that it can be accessed more efficiently. With this, I don't want to change the target code, uh, target source code, or in the library or somewhere else, or required to recompile it. So how to do it? We just use the existing binary with PMU sampling and the dwarf debug information. So before going to that, uh, let's look at the existing profilers, memory profilers. Uh, to be honest, I'm not an expert in this field, so maybe I missed something. But roughly, I think there are two kinds of memory profilers, which is one is on, based on the PMU sampling, so it or targets on the memory accesses. Like, so perp tools has two commands for this. Perp man is um, kind of general memory access profiles using information from the PMU samples. And there are perp C to C, which is similar, but it's more focused on the catching the data false sharings. So this talk is about this kind of profilers, and I think it, we can improve this uh, profiling technique by adding type information there. On the other hand, there are some heap memory allocation-based profilers. Like, uh, heap track is a great project to check uh, memory leaks and heap use patterns. And also, Belgrind is a very good tool to do a lot of things, including yeah, memory leak checks and uninitialized memory checks and simulating the cache behavior and so on and so on. I'm not sure this project can help on these profilers too, but in general, it'd be great if they have some type information in their analysis. So PMU memory sampling. So modern uh, processors have PMU, performance monitoring units, and they provide very precise information about the samples they capture. Actually, perf event has a modifier, P modifier, to enable this precise sampling, which gives you basically a, a accurate memory, uh, no, accurate uh, instruction address of the sample. But if you use some dedicated memory sampling event, you can get more information about your memory access, including the data address it accesses and where the access actually happens, like from L is from L1 cache or L cache or memory or whatever, or actual what's the actual latency in cycles, or what the cache snooping status, and so on. So this kind of information is very useful to analyze your memory behavior. So we want to use this information with the type information. The supported vendors, the all major CPU vendors now support this kind of precise memory sampling. So, but they have a different level of uh, support. So on Intel, Intel have PAPS, Process Event-Based Sampling. They started this very early and they have the most advanced um, functionalities. So they can target load or store operations specifically, and they can also can filter on load operation on the latencies. 
So you can filter like uh, I want to sample memory operations longer than this cycle so, or shorter than this cycle, things like that. On AMD, they have IBS, which is an instruction-based sampling. They have similar information, but they have some limitation that they only capture random instructions. They have no control which one, or they cannot specifically target the memory operations. You can just random samples and check if it's a memory operation, and then we can use that information. On ARM, they have SP, Statistical Profiling Extension, I think. I think it's pretty much similar to AMD IBS, but they have filters. So they can filter load or store operations, and they have latency filters. But to me, it's not clear if they, when they apply the filters, if it's from the beginning of the pipeline stage or the last one, or if, if it's the last one, they will drop the sample if it's matched to filters, right? Not matched to filters. But yeah, maybe I could be wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So to get the precise memory samples, um, you can simply run the perp memory code command. So it will pick the best event in your system, basically. And there are some options to control the behavior. Like uh, you can you can target uh, load operations only or store only, or you can set uh, different latency filter values. And you want uh, corner code, you want sample corner codes only. And if you are really familiar with this, you can use plain corporate code command with your event. So this is an output of, uh, of an example. So I ran my program with perp memory code command. And after that, I can run perp, perp plain perp annotate to see the dis disassembly of the functions. So as you can see, there are three samples. Uh, I mean, I mean, three instructions get samples in this code. So I put the red boxes. So first number in the box is the the overhead based on the the sample counters. And second number is offset in the code if it's a target of jump instruction, and then there are instructions. So here you can see the memory instruction, usually move instruction, and there are operands that uh, describe the memory location. On x86 AT&T syntax, it will have a pair of parentheses for the memory operations. So you can see the first instruction has RDI register as a base and offset of four. Second one, as RBP with this offset of minus four. And last one is from R RSI register and offset of eight. With this memory location, you can look up the devoted uh, information in Dwarf, and you can find this register names in the uh, relevant devoted information. So I ran it. Uh, with read out dash wi command, which dumps debug information section, debug info section, and there will be a variable or parameter in the function. So dwarf location description. So um, as you can see, dwarf has location expression to specify the object in your program is located, right? So it's basically a simple tag machine to specify register location or memory location with uh, some operations like arithmetic, logical operation, or step manipulations. With that, you can get the location of your object. If your target object, variable, or um, parameter 
as a single location, the debug entry will have the expression directly inside that entry. But if it has multiple uh, location, uh, when it moves to a different location in the code, like from register to stack or things like that, it will have a list of location with a code range it covers and the location expression, as you said before. So let's look at the example how to get the, uh, the relevant dwarf information. So for example, we have a sample instruction on the upper right in the black box. It has an instruction address 0x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And it has move up, uh, instruction with uh, memory operand and RCX register. So we need to look up the dwarf information. Some basics on dwarf. It, uh, it's a, basically a tree structure and each entry can have a child entries, which has a relevant information to the parent. So on Tom level, it can be like, you can, you can see it like a, a list of compiled units. And compiled units correspond to a source file. So you first need to, which compiled unit your code is in. Then it will look up the child entries uh, to have uh, relevant information to form a scope like a functions, like a lexical blocks, inline subroutines, they will have their own uh, scope or variables or parameters. So you look up into the child until you cannot find anything more. In this example, there are three and there are six uh, scopes from the compound unit. And the last one is lexical unit. It has a list of variables. And the last lexical block has the code range from uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 0. So it will cover our instruction 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 5, 6. Okay, then it it finds a list of uh, scopes and then it will try to look up variables in that scopes from the very last one and going up until it finds something. So when you check the uh, variable entry, you first need to look up uh, the location list first. With the instruction address, this variable has two location lists in the gray box above. First one, uh, it, first one covers only from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4. So it's not. Second one covers this instruction. So we find the second one. And then we need to check the actual location with the instruction. Instruction has the RCX, and this location list also has RCX. So we are matched. So we, are, we can use this variable for this instruction, right? Then this variable will have the time information in it. Most likely, it will be a pointer type because we are using memory. Uh, we access memory using the pointer. If it's a pointer, we can get the base type of the pointer. So that will be the target data type, right? And also, the instruction has an offset from that register. With that information, we can find which field in the data struct, in this case, the struct type, which field in the struct we are accessing. So with all this information, we can construct a sample of data types like this. This is the output of the purple report with type. Uh, sorted by time. As you can see, there are still many things that are unknown. We cannot find the matching variable or something. And second one is sort of RQ, which corresponds to a run queue at each CPU to manage uh, one of our tasks. And third one is unsigned long, maybe from some bitmap operations or something. 
So yeah, this is not perfect, but I'd like to improve with help of some toolchain support. And the next uh, output is per perp annotate, and it shows per field access profile in a data structure. As I mentioned, it, uh, it targets right now the uh, RB node, which is a red black tree node, and it gets total six samples. But three of them are from the first field RB parent color, one from RB right, two from RB left. So you can see which field is more accessed. And if you combine load and store events together, you can see which field is load mostly and write mostly, this kind of thing. So basically, this is how it works. But there are still many issues you want to solve. First one is, as you can see the previous example, sometimes you cannot find no variables. You cannot find variables. So imagine um, this simple uh, example code, function foo, has a parameter, single parameter PTR, and it has a local variable val. So it can generate a binary code like this, like in the black box below. And imagine we have sampled on the right, the, the last instruction, the move, last move instruction with RCX register. But most likely the debug information from this uh, function will have this on the right box. There are function foo, it has a former parameter, PTR, with location or the I register and local variable in the stack. But it has no information for RCX because no variable for RCX, right? So this is the most case it cannot find the type information. So there are some possible solutions. First one is to do from the tools, like to off uh, consumer side to build type information table from the variable or parameter type information. As you can see, it has a, a parameter in the dwarf information. And the first move instruction is from the parameter because it starts from the BTR and the code. So if you follow that move and transfer type information from the beginning of the uh, function, we can build which register has which type of information. Yes, sir. Sorry, let me hit you, Mike. Yeah. So you will, uh, you mean that the, the you will disassemble, what's it, yeah, Codes. way back that the, the assemble language and uh, find that the, uh, which one is, uh, I'll say, that the, uh, accessing from uh, where? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is what I can do without uh, changing compilers or dwarf. So yeah, it I'm... starts from what it knows and transfer mm. the information. So that are using the, the, uh, the same uh, uh, assembler, uh, disassembler uh, output and uh, passing the, the, the uh, instructions and uh, uh, what's it? Location? Uh, yeah, they're finding that the location, uh, what's it, that are um, uh, offset and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, finding that the next, uh, Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah. So the register likely to point uh, a point a type. Yeah. And we have offset, and we can find the type in the struct at that offset and move it to the target register. Right. Okay. So that are uh, yes, yeah, it will work. Yeah, most of the time uh, it will work, but uh, yeah, of course you need uh, sometimes that are the compiler uh, optimization will. Uh, or say change that the, the 
right the we will talk about it later so. <laughs> Okay, yeah, this is a basic approach. This is what I can do now. So I'm working on it, this. But as you said, we can do better if Dwarf has more information. So another solution could be for compilers to generate more information, like uh, in this, the point to chain case, they can generate uh, the intermediate artificial develop information entries for each uh, point of time in the middle of the chain. Then you can find, without, even without uh, variable names, you can find the, the entry using the location information and we can, we can find the types. Or maybe more costly some way. I, I found a suggestion, a discussion in the Duop mailing list that to build a lookup table like uh, I built in the previous slide to look up from the location to a variable or type. Yeah, so I think there are other interested folks out there to do things like this. So I hope we have some support in the toolchain side for this. And there are compiler optimizations. And I noticed compiler can move uh, struct field. They can change struct layouts for some local variables. I think it's from SROA pass. And it can optimize uh, struct layouts to, I think, to reduce tech space? Well, I don't know. But yeah, I, I saw some cases, it generates very complex location and expression in some variable types, some aggregate variable types, like struct or union, maybe struct. So right now I just made it reject this complex uh, location expressions. So it, it's hard to track all question. Um, I thought that the uh, the uh, was it that the the dwarf inform uh, information is uh, was it made by your uh, optimized code or not? So that uh, uh, even if the compiler will uh, change that the uh, was it the uh, layout layout uh, the dwarf information will be also updated yes. for that. Yeah. Yes. Right. They will they updated dwarf information, but it's hard hard to follow. Like we only assume the layout is is same all all the time with with the source. Maybe not necessarily it's the same with the source, but anyway, we use offsets, so mm -hmm. it needs to be consistent with the type information in the dwarf entry. Mm -hmm. it's, if it's the same, we are fine. But yeah. sometimes, some after some compiler optimizations, you know, struct is placed, it, it's scattered around in the stack, right? Oh, it's, mixed with different variables. You mean that there are the context-based uh, different uh, have a different uh, data? No, 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 no. Just, so that's it's just plain stack local variables in a struct type. Ah, I see. So that yeah. it's mapped to the local uh, variables. Yeah, they extract uh, two integer types from different struct and put them like just and yeah, things like that. Okay. They're very hard to. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So I just reject those complex location expressions now. So what it can accept is just simple cases mostly. <laughs> the most cases is a just a pointer variable in a register. That's the most case, common case. Or for global variables, the location expression could be a, a absolute memory address. And stack variables, it's a offset from the base of the stack frame. So you can accept those simple uh, locations. 
but if it's become complex more than that, well, I don't know. And I also found <laughs> there are <laughs> struct layout randomization patch. No, no, it's it's a there's a config in the kernel. Like I, I think it's a security feature, but it makes me scary. So there's I think there's a plugin to randomize some their structures, like uh, structures, but. According to the kconfig uh, help message, I think it's mainly focused on the struct with function pointers only. But, I, I think it, I think it'll write a mind more than that. Uh, okay, then then we are in trouble. <laughs> I don't know. So I haven't tested it yet, but I hope they will they they would update the the layout information in Dwarf yeah, after sure. randomization. Sure. Yeah. Then it might work. And language support issues, of course. So to simplify my work, I target to, to my work to C program only. And right now the first target is kernel, of course, on x86. But C has its own issues, like uh, union types, there's conflicting uh, very uh, memory pointers, right? In the same offset, then we don't know which one we choose. And array can be complex in the location expressions or bit field, maybe. And typecast can be a problem also, since we have this variable in this type, but actual access can be a different type, then we don't know. And sometimes it uh, access memory using a return value from a function call, right? And then may not have the, the type uh, location or type information. So there are some issues in, in C, but to more general user space support, it should support more complex languages, C++, Rust, maybe Rust it for kernel two and go. Uh, for you, for unions, you could sometimes disambiguate by using by looking at the kind of instruction. So, if you are accessing a one byte, then there will be a different instruction than accessing a long. So, that way you could let's say, oh, it's accessing that field and not this field. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Uh, but if it's in same size, then oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but then you deal with one. Right, right. Yeah, more difficult. Yeah. If if there's a chain of pointers right. and with union, then we are screwed. Yeah, we we'll have to look both to see if you can integrate. Can be complex, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, there are some issues, and actually, I'm not familiar with this languages like C plus one. Lost. I need some help on it. So, it's it's. Not my this time. It's not not my target. But I want to focus on the kernel only at this moment. But kernel has some uh, special kind of variables called Percipu. So Percipu variables in the kernel is so it's a big chunk of array, and each CPU will get a copy of its uh, its own copy of the variables. So it will have a different start offset for its CPU, and access to that CPU, uh, access to that CPU per CPU variable will start from that offset and add the address for that variable. And I guess thread local storage in user space will have the similar concerns. So in this case, as I said, the location express expression will be complex, well, not that complex, uh, anyway, not so simple, right? So, and, and for this CPU case, to, to access uh, variables in the local CPU, it has a different form of uh, instruction. So it will use the GS segment registers and the variable uh, address directly. So we need to understand this format too. 
And there are issues with the split dwarf. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I don't follow the development on this side, so I don't know the status. So I'm curious how well it's supported. So dwarf four with fission and dwarf five will support split debug information and, and, and multiple files. So, and perp tool use a lib DW library for dwarf parsing, but I'm not sure it will support multiple files to get the debug information. Gotcha. So uh, Alpha Utils does support split dwarf uh, if you're using the original format where every object file gets its own .dwo file. I don't know if, as long as like perf is just using standard libdw access to it, it should work. Uh, the other way you can do split dwarf is the DWP format where you squish all the DWO files into a DWP file and then delete all the DWO files. And Elfidal's upstream doesn't support that, but I have patches that uh, are currently being reviewed that should add that, but no one really uses that. <laughs> Yes. But like I have internal customers that want DWP support in the kernel. Yeah. So it's one of these things where everyone wants less debug info <laughs> and stuff, but like the industry is kind of ossifying awesome more P4. Yep. So like we keep trying to push for more P5 or split work. And then like all the other tooling that needs to consume it is all broke. Yeah. And the funny thing is I think Google and Meta are the only ones that use DWP. So we're the only ones that run into this. But the Alpha Utils should support it soon. Okay. And there were some performance issues during the development on the object dump. So object dump is needed to disassemble the code to analyze the location information and do like uh, build a type table things. So every function, it gets samples. I need to run object dump to get the disassembly, but it was terribly slow. So the problem was uh, when it uh, runs with the debug information. So I used the perf annotate a code to call the object dump but it has dash L option by default to, to print line number information, but I didn't need it. So after removing that option and make it con conditional, now it's run much faster. But at the moment I had a dash L option to print line number information. The LLVM object dump was much, much faster than GNU version. After I removed the GNU ob object dump runs faster than LLVM. <laughs> have, have you tried data type profiling the disassembler itself? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, oh yeah, I, I plan to run object dump <laughs> with data type profiling, yeah. So maybe we, on x86 and list, we have in kernel instruction decoder, so we can do simple things in this uh, manually, like uh, extract location information from the target instruction. Maybe harder to 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 do all the disassembly, but we can we can extract that information. Question. So, how do you uh, say that there? Um, Specify that there's an object dump. Uh, I think that the object dump has an uh, option to uh, dis, uh, disassemble one, just one uh, specific function or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I specify the code range, start address, and stop. The element hmm. is the element is somewhere. You can give it a function symbol and say just disassemble this function. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think it would be the same. Mm. So uh, it, it doesn't. Dump all all the instruction in the target. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the in, uh, in kernel instruction decoder is much faster, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. But how much faster you want that to be? 
I mean, what kind of issues are we talking about here? I remember seeing some emails about this, but I don't recall right now. I yeah, mean, so how slow it is? Uh, it depends on the the number of samples and number of distinct uh, function and instructions to get samples. But for some example, I have a sample data. It runs, uh, it's fixed in the my V2 hosting and V1, it runs like uh, five, less than five minutes, but five, four minutes, 30 seconds-ish. But with V2, it runs in 10 seconds. Okay, got you. Yeah, and you, this is the only in X86. Yeah, really. okay, because each this assembler is actually a different world. Mm, yeah, in okay. binutils, yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. Yeah, but the goal is uh, not to call object dump as much as possible. Use uh, in, in kernel instruction decoder, and X86 is much harder to do it manually. But I guess other architectures. Is more easier. So that's it. So now Perp tools are implementing the data type profiling with PM new samples and dwarf debug information. And I need more some help from tool chains to have uh, better dwarf information. And let's make it more useful and easy to use. And here are links to my hostings and Thank you for listening. Okay, we start here. We go back then. So you mentioned in the very beginning. So this kind of information is used to guide the compiler to do some structure layout optimization, right? Is that a major purpose? Not the compiler, folks. It's, it's to uh, developers uh. to to maybe compile it too, but ba uh, main uh, motivation was to to each developer understand uh. their uh, type, their type memory behaviors. Okay, so uh, it's not a target to be used by the compiler to do optimization. Maybe we can do that later, but not okay. at this time. The problem is that they need to understand the whole program uh. to make sure that it's safe to swap two fields, right? How yeah, do they yeah. Know? So they need whole program kind of analysis to do this. Yeah, but we, we already Maybe have the Maybe profile guard optimization kind of things can be done later. Okay. So there, origin, originally there is some uh, structure layout optimization, uh, the compiler, based on the whole program mode, and then the compiler can instrument the, the program to profile in the, the structure during runtime. So do you, so it's, it's a different. So this one, your work is only based on the, the object file, right? You're starting from the object file and then reverse engineer to get the type information. Unless we have uh, dwarf information. So you are not, not from the source, source, source code level to... No, no, no. no, no, no. You, you the from, from, from the bottom yeah, right. up. Right. Okay. And then provide the type information, then analyze the program. Then how to use it, how to use it still. It's more like Perp is giving you the program counter. Uh. So access is really hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you're going in dwarf and, and working from the location lists mm. to say like at this program counter, what could possibly be at this offset? Okay. Like what type? What type is used most? Have okay. You, have okay. you taken a look at the perp mem or perp C to C command? Mm. I recommend it. We and cannot do the. We cannot do what you suggest because we want the data to be from production uh -huh. workload. It's not like, hey, let's run a, a binary oh, instrument okay, to, to okay. trace. Mm. Uh, at Google, we cannot do this on all the applications. They don't have a benchmark or something like this. We want to do the okay. same approach as AutoFDO, that you collect the data from production okay. 
workloads, not instrumented. So they need to be optimized. So the code needs to be optimized. Oh, yeah. And you come in with low overhead, you sample, and you, you do the analysis offline. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to add something. The, 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 the motivation behind this is like to try to optimize the, the data accesses. Why? It's because we believe that you may bring more more cache lines to the core than you really need to do the work. It's about reducing the memory bandwidth usage. Right? It's about minimizing this. And if you bring a cache line of 64 bytes, you better use 64 bytes, not just two. That's false sharing, isn't it? No, it's not just false sharing. It's just, hey, I'm just bringing a byte, but I, I, I'm just bringing a whole cache line of 64 bytes, and I just use one byte. Right? And then my other hot field is in another cache line. Says, no, it's so expensive to bring a cache line that you better make use of it at the maximum. So it starts with maybe organizing your data structure a bit differently to optimize for this. The whole can do reorganization of the structs to, to get it more packet. Right. Uh, the, the idea is getting this information. Uh, we would see, oh, there's this access, then another access, then another access. That, and they are on the same like sequence of events, like the same function, let's say. And then you you could instead of three cache lines, you you bring just one. Yeah. That that's one case. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, automatic because that's how the, the cache hierarchy works, yes? You you would get this thing. And other things is like, oh, this algorithm is not uh well tuned because it's getting things from another node in another Numa node. So the latency will characterize that. The, uh, getting from uh, the, the local memory, that latency. But that bigger latency is getting from another Numa node. So that, that that's the kind of thing that you, once you have this characterized and map it back to the fields, you can go on. That is not just one thing. There are multiple things that you can be detecting. False sharing as well. Okay. Looking at like, that data profile guide, that could be. That could, I mean, you you, you could re rewrite the the, the 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 source code and recompile. That that could be as well, or, or inform the compiler and the compiler does it for you. Yeah, if we uh, find that there are some something like uh, referring that are some pointers or something like that, we can uh, other uh, what's a prefetch uh, instruction before that. Um, there was... uh, uh, I have one question. So is it possible to feed the uh, profile data back to the compiler so the compiler could reorder all the uh, struct layout? Yeah, pretty much like, you know, all type of deal, but for memory. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, someday. Thanks. Yeah, maybe not this moment. Yeah, Okay. You have five four mi four minutes. Five minutes. More questions? I don't know. I mean, if you said it that so far the the data that it needs from the PMU is just the ability to to sample loads and stores precisely, and all the architectures support this. He, he, he was showing it just on the x86, but on on x86 Intel, but on x86 AMD, you can do that. Uh, on ARM, you can do that. So it's a portable kind of approach, right? The, the dwarf is like the same. It's just that the PMU needs to point you to a load or star instruction. And they all do that. More information that you can get from PEBS. Yeah, you can get, let's say, let's say the offset in the cache line that calls it the, that latency, that load store. So uh, uh, he mentioned getting the offset from the, from the instruction, from the IP. Perhaps at some point in some of the cases that are difficult to solve, you, you could use the offset from the cache line you, to, to help find the type. All the PMUs can also give you the data address, the address of the load or the unit now, but it's, it's available. Um, I understand this is sample based. That's why you mentioned how to FTO, right? So it would be something similar. But I mean, if it could be done in a not intrusive way to the, to the, yeah. No, but I mean, it, maybe instrumentalization could also play a role in the sense that you could, you could, yeah, that's why the if, that's why the if, yeah. So you could generate the profile data and then. Yeah. 
It's not the rare access to it, we want the hot access to it. And the PMU is designed for that. So you will get uh, do you have a particular specific list of features? I think it was the last slide that you will benefit to have in the toolchain. Yeah, this one. Okay. To, to make an artificial <laughs> yeah. table entry for the chain of pointer cases like SPTR, another pointer variable access. And maybe this is a to something to discuss in the in the kernel tool chains list. Uh, it's not been already. Patches to the tool chains list. Yeah, but you know this part. No, I mean, the, what you require, what would you benefit to have in the tool chain, in the different compilers? Mm -hmm. Better dwarf, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now, I, I mostly I need uh, more debug information for this missing part of the memory access. Uh, what you mean is that I think the dwarf is designed for debuggers. So you go yeah. from a variable and it will tell you which register has the variable. And here we have the register. We want to find the, the, the variables, the reverse. Right? And that's why it's difficult. It doesn't work all the time. But if you had that, then you could, you could solve this more easily. A common issue that I've had is I'm trying to track down, like Clang has very excessive stack usage, very bad. And it's actually very sloppy with the lifetime of values, which is important for stack slot coloring for reducing the stack usage. And it also spills more than it needs to, and there's bugs, we need to fix them. Um, but there's nothing in the tooling to say, like draw me, break out the crayons and draw me a picture of what does my stack look like? What values are being stored where in the stack? And Technically, there's a temporal dimension because as the program counter moves, you may be spilling something suddenly into a stack slot or reloading it, and then now it's that stack slot is dead and you're, you don't touch it anymore. But your your problem is similar, and I've done similar things with looking at Dwarf to try to draw that picture, but like it would be nice if the compiler could draw that for me, but your problem is even more generic than just the stack. You care about all the memory accesses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.